I, I said I was just going to make a few remarks, but then as I was sitting there and looking at all of you, I got to think of so many things that I wanted to tell you all. And the very first one, was I was reminded when she says, remember celebration and something else. Well, I also want you to remember that we're on to phase two. We're building that arts campus on the Sea Alaska Plaza. And then we've got phase three, but I won't tell you about that yet. But phase two, guys, we're going to need all the support that we can get. And I know you've been wonderful in the past, but I just was reminded of that. So watch out for our, our, all of our capital campaign material on phase two for our arts campus across the street. But I, what I really wanted to say was that I want to thank you, you guys. You are the ones who are bringing us the success that we are having in our language revitalization efforts. I was looking at our warriors over here, and we put the warriors up here purposefully because we said that to survive, you know, if I'm panting a little bit, if I'm kind of shaking around, I had a little minor surgery this morning, and I'm supposed to be resting for 24 hours. <laughs> but I love my work and what we're doing so much, I can't do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, so I, we put these up, you know, because we said we still have to be warriors in this present day society if we are going to survive as indigenous people, as tribal people. We have to have political warriors. We have to have cultural warriors. And we have to have you as language warriors. Now, I know some people don't like to call it warriors. They want to talk about healing and all that thing. And that's wonderful, too. But we still have to be strong and fight for the survival of our languages. And I see that you sitting here are all part of that. You, with our partnership organization, uh, Clinkett and Haida, Gold Belt, University of Alaska, and all the school districts that we work with throughout the region. So I just want to acknowledge you and thank you for your efforts. I always say, <laughs> tell Michelle and the teachers, I just have such great admiration for you teaching in the schools, because those little kids scare me. <laughs> <laughs> What responsibility you have to teach those little munchkins. You know, I always say, those of us teaching at the university, we just give lectures, and if the kids don't listen, well, that's not my fault, you know? I don't have responsibility, like you teachers do. So I, I always just want to say, I thank you so much for all of your work. But I always have always said, that we owe our thanks to the Hawaiians. They were our first mentors. We first met four women up in Anchorage at the Keepers, Keepers of the Treasure meeting. And they told us about what was going on in Hawaii. And so we said, we've got to go there. And because um, we had just said, the Board of Trustees had said 20 years ago, it's almost 20 years ago, that language is going to be our highest priority for SHI. And uh, so we said, we've got to go to Hawaii, and we've got to see what they do. And we went there, and we met with our friends who have become our lifelong friends, and they showed us what they were doing. They gave us the inspiration that we can do it like they have done and like they are doing. Our board of trustees went and visited, and I want to thank Gail too, because Gail was the one that you know, showed us around, told us what we should be doing, and uh, uh, she brought us to the schools. And when our trustees saw those little munchkins speaking in Hawaiian, it was it was almost embarrassing because all 12 or nine of them were standing in the front crying, you know. But they became convinced because of their, their doings, because of what the success that they had. And so you gave us that inspiration. You have been our inspiration. And I know they always thank the Maori uh, for starting it off, but for us, you are our inspiration, and I want to thank you, and thank you again for coming to help us.
Thank you, Rosita, for warming up the audience and speaking from the heart. And um, it's true, it's, um, it's you all that are gonna do the work. So without further ado, let me tell you all about our guest. Um, in today's talk, the AHA Punanaleo approach to Hawaiian language revitalization, Drs. Kawanoi Kamana and William Wilson, they are president and director of the nonprofit AHA Punana Leo. They will describe how the organization moved forward to reach the state's current level of language vitality. Included in the description will be the role of networking and other native peoples, including Alaska natives, in ensuring programmatic success. Dr. Kawanoi Kamana is the founding member of the AHA Punana Leo and serves as its president. Um, as a teacher and administrator, she works with students, teachers, and families to reestablish the vibrancy of Hawaiian language and culture in Hawaii. And Dr. William Pila Wilson is a founding member of the AHA Punana Leo and serves on its board of directors. Pila was born in Honolulu um, after his parents came to Hawaii during World War II. Um, <clears throat> Pila has played a key role in developing state laws for education through Hawaiian and in, and in establishing U.S. federal policies to protect and promote Native American languages. The AHA Punanaleo is credited with beginning and sustaining the current Hawaiian language revitalization movement. When the movement began, full proficiency in Hawaiian was restricted to those born before 1920 and to a small population of 200 on a remote island. There were fewer than 50 children under 18 able to speak the language fluently. Today, nearly 4,000 children are enrolled in schooling through the Hawaiian and the language is most widely reported um, as the non-English home language. So without further ado, please welcome Kawanoi and Pilar, come on up. So I'm going to tell you what Cohen and I said and then give my, some of my own thoughts. But first of all, Cohen and I said um, she expressed aloha greetings to the three um, peoples that Sea Alaska represents, the Klinkit, Haida, and Simshian peoples, the um, ancient people who gave, came before your ancestors uh, who um, are so important to the very meeting here as well as you, the descendants, and the rest of the community that's gathered here. I want to greet everyone and uh, also express the um, great appreciation for this building. 
that shows such great pride in your heritage and your people from before and what they've done and your determination to move forward with those things and maintain them for future generations and for the children. And um, so, so proud to be here and join with you and, and share what we have to offer uh, because we're all together in this work. We all um, share so much and I want to thank, uh, personally thank Rosita for what she said and also um, remind her that when she came that we also gained so much from Clinket people. Um, now we mentioned always about the canoe that we, we received the, um, the Browns family helped get a big log to make a canoe in Hawaii. But we also received special support from William Demert. Um, and I don't know how many of you know him or heard of that family, but he was a really important person on a national level for native issues in education. And he came and helped us. And he played a big role in working on laws, et cetera, in Washington. And said that I was involved in that, and I certainly was. But he was like the person right on the ground there. And, we're t sharing with him that what were some of the areas that were causing problems for us, and he was really great. He, he moved things forward. He brought also together um, the Hawaiians with the National Indian Education Association, which he was a founder. So we have a lot of uh, connections, and even today we see some Hawaiians in the crowd here, and it's really great to have that and see that those kinds of connections are here and go back many years when the days of the whalers and all those things. So we're very happy to be here and we're gonna share as best we can with what we have. Um, but uh, we just are really overwhelmed with the beauty of this place as well. It's really a beautiful place you have here. Your building and just the land and the, the snow. snow. <laughs> the, the winter wonderland, we really enjoyed it. So, um, we have snow. <laughs> we have snow on Mauna Kea. It came, we got a little bit, and we thought, wow, the snow in Mauna Kea. But, but boy, boy, there's a lady up there named Poli Ahu who spreads her blanket. Boy, she really <laughs> made it here. Boy, it's amazing. I, oh, no, Leila. Um, I thought um, I'm going to start by just showing a map of Hawaii. Just so I know some of the people here have, are born in Hawaii and, and all, and some of you have been there before, but I think it might be just useful to see uh, the map so, and also show you where we are living. So there's the eight islands and uh, Honolulu there is the capital, the big city. And we live in Hilo over there in Hilo High. So we have a Hilo High graduate here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. We live in Hilo and uh, work at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, and uh, our programming is there, but we have our Punanaleo uh, language nest throughout the Hawaiian Islands and programs throughout the Hawaiian Islands. We'll be talking about that at one point, but we're gonna concentrate on what we're doing in Hilo. In Hilo, we have from an infant toddler program all the way through to the graduate, um, through the PhD, and we have a graduate here with us tonight. So um, <clears throat> we, we thought what we'd do is show you some videos, use that as um, points of discussion, and then move forward with that. So um, the first video is about our laboratory school. It's um, about five, how many years old? Yeah. He'll, now we'll, okay, Kona is gonna talk well, about it. Well, 2000, so, so, some time ago, but it's still real rough, man. The name of our school is Kikula Onahuni Yokalani Oku. Kind of gives you an overview of what we do at our school. It is a preschool through grade 12 school. And uh, it's turned a Hawaiian language uh, medium school that is we use Hawaiian as a language of instruction and communication with everyone. So it's not just the teacher with the students in the classroom, but the teachers among themselves for me as the principal and the director of the school, within administration, also the people who are cleaning the rooms. These people are all speakers of Hawaiian who are learning how to speak Hawaiian. So uh, we wanted the school represent the living language for, for the children. So that's the kind of school that Nami is. And it's a laboratory for 
our college program. Our college of Hawaiian Language at yeah. the University of Waikiki, so it's a laboratory school on that campus. All right, so All right. maybe you can start. He puko a hui o ko e kani e ka aina. O bai ko bai polo le e hia kia hai no ko. Ai mai te i hoa mau hoa mau. Ka i kia viki viki o le matama ke o ya. Viki viki na na. Ono o ka uala. O ka ole o ka mea e hoa pili ai ka po e ke kai me ke kai he lahui a lo kai maluno ke kai ano no no. O ka bai ole o ko i no e ha o ma ke hiki. No leila no kako ka po e Hawaii. Aia maloko ka kako olelo ia mau ao ao ka ike he Hawaii. Aloha uilani ana ko i no no hopa mo ko no o sina. No leila he koko ka ike ana ka olelo Hawaii. I ka ho i ana i ke la ko ana ike ao. The basic reason that you need to put an extreme amount of effort into maintaining Hawaiian is that English is so super overpowering in our contemporary society in Hawaii. So in order to make Hawaiian strong, you have to put an extra effort into that. Nestled in Puna on the island of Hawaii, Ke Kulo Navahio Kalani Opu'u is home to a preschool through 12th grade program pursuing academic success from a solid foundation in our language and culture. Olelo no eo. Te aka manao o keia, olelo no eo. All modeled after one of Hawaii's legendary figures. Born and raised in the school's home of Puna, Joseph Koho'oluhi Navahio Kalani Opu'u served his people in many ways as a legislator, a lawyer, and even a newspaper publisher. E kumu ho'ohalike o Navahi maumuli o kona ano he kanaka aloha lahui o yaka mua. A leila aloha aina, aloha ho'ona'awao. I koe mana o oia ka waiwai nui o keia papahana o ka o ka nuu kia o ke kula no ane i ko kakuola no ka mea no ane i nei noe. The school is grounded in traditional Hawaiian ways of thinking but its philosophy of education is anything but old. Navahio Kalani Opu'u is building on the state's existing Hawaiian immersion program to create a 100% Hawaiian medium experience. Now, Hawaiian medium education goes beyond the classroom to include the entire school. And that means the librarian, the janitor, and the principal, everyone using Hawaiian as a language of the school. Kahuli. Hopili mai. Huli. Aye. And that's really the idea of Hawaiian medium education, to be normal, to have Hawaiian language and culture normalized, to be on TV. Aloha mai kako. He mea koi koi maoli no ke yaninu nei pili na aina lia lii. To be in the grocery store. Ka mea ho omake aka. Aia wau ka hapa nui yukai. And of course to be in school. This all allows for a high level of fluency that's beneficial on many levels. Well, first there's a cultural benefit of being able to live your life in Hawaiian language from a Hawaiian perspective, totally from a Hawaiian point of view. However, there's also academic uh, benefits. Research has shown throughout the world that children who know two languages really, really well have a cognitive advantage over all other children. Oh. 
Navahi Leadership is working with institutions and agencies such as the Educational Testing Service to help develop valid and reliable measures that confirm these advantages of a Navahi Hawaiian medium education. Kapoi haku ho ike nui kolako hoi hoi i ka ike i kapoi oivi e imi i kaikana i ke kahi ho ike e ho ike ahu valeana i ke akamai o ke ia mau keiki e au ia nei ma loko o ka uh, kalako o lelo uivi. This cutting-edge educational opportunity involves and appeals to families young and old from a variety of backgrounds. We wanted our children to have the experience of being educated in, in Hawaiian language and Hawaiian culture. We felt that um, having that experience would allow them to develop the other skills and academic success that they needed to, to be successful in, in today's environment. Nui Kahana, but it was worth it. And the thing is, my father's generation and my generation, you know, we lost the language. So that's why we needed to bring it back. And the, the reason why I wanted Kopa to go to Olelo Hawaii School was to bring back the language in our ohana. For many of our ohana, this experience begins with the Punanaleo preschool program. The entire Navahi environment fosters this way of learning, from the educational approaches and strategies to the physical environment as well. In Hawaiian thinking, learning takes place everywhere. So the garden in that respect is one of our most precious classrooms here at Navahi. Math is very abstract in that you have to, you know, take numbers and crunch them. And that's what people typically think about math. The mala allows us to apply it to real life situations. So one example would be just measuring the growth of the wala plant which then allows us to plan better with our certain gathering. It's not just going through the motions, but actually applying that knowledge to your work, to your life. And it's that practical application of traditional ways of thinking about contemporary content that's key to this Navahi educational experience. An experience that culminates with a very unique graduation, a week-long program that involves the entire ohana. Hauoli loa wau me ka hopena, ke ia pulehe hoi hoi loa iau, me ka ukeiki ka uka ane ko ohana holo koa. O kalei ke keiki mua ma ka ohana, puka ana mai ke kai kula o lelo Hawaii e. Nui ko ma ko haahe o iaia. O lako na poe i ku mea u no ku o la holo koa. Ale la he mea nui ka ohana hana ia a ku haahe o no lako. Mahea la e hele ai ke kanaka ma hope o ke ia. He mea nui ka ho mana o ana no hea mai. Nokia, Kavahia, Kaohana, Apela, Aeho, Imaumai, Ikamoku, Aho. 
Kaneni Kobai Aiamaka Imoku has a clear understanding of where she came from. She started as a keiki punana leo and was a member of the very first graduating class at Navahi. She completed her college education, including a master's degree in teaching, and has returned to Navahi as both a teacher and a parent. Kahana <laughs> Aina pa kela mau mea ke puka aku mai ki ano kula hiki ke komo mana ano mea like ole mana ano aina like ole me ka hila hila ole i kona ano mauli ke ike ia nei ona ke ki puka mai na mehi na ho mana puka mai ke kula nui aku ke ole lo mai nei me na pepe ala ko mai ka hanau ana he 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 ho aino na mauli ke lo ki ola Ke Kula o Navahi o Kalani o Pu'u, a unique and progressive educational experience producing academic results, but even more importantly, providing an opportunity for families to be a part of revitalizing and sustaining our language and culture. No, Leila, I na ho maka e hoi hoi ka ohana i kela ano, hana pu ana, alu like ana, hapai like ana ke kahi mea, E no no kalai lai ana kela kanaka kela ohana i i kona i kaika he aha kau e hanai he aha kau e lave ai e ha avi ai no kapono o kau keiki kau mau keiki ana kela kiola kanaka ana ba o kona va hanau alai la kala e ha alele ai kona kapau ana. Nole na hana ea e apa o iwaina o ia mau la e lua, o ia na la i pono e hoohana i ai ka ole loho wai. O ia ka pau hopu. We thought maybe we'd talk a little bit about this. First, before we go on to the next, we have three videos that we're gonna show. So I think it's important to know, first of all, the school, Navahi school, is, it's in the Pune district, um, just outside of Hilo. And it's part of, uh, it's a very complicated um, arrangement. It has the Pune Naleo, which is nonprofit and owns the property. Then we have a charter school from kindergarten through grade eight. And then from grade nine to 12, it's part of Hilo High School. It's an off-campus um, program of Hilo High School, which is 30 minutes away. <laughs> so it's a, and it's by law, a laboratory school for our Hawaiian language college. So you can see we had to go make some little laws and st strange things. And we did, it didn't, Things didn't start like that. We started with just a little preschool in Hilo with how many kids did we start with? Okay, four, 14, that, that uh, Hilo High School is part of our Department of Education. Right. So usually when people come, or when we show a video like this, people think, wow, I mean, how did you get the DOE to say yes? Or how did you get the charter school to support your cause? And well, they really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and and they, it, re, it was not their idea, no. And it still is not their idea. Uh, so we started with the Punana Leo, uh, the language nest, and then those families became the power pushers of it growing one year at a time. So I think I mentioned to someone today that, you know, when you, when you have a child, they're not gonna wait for you. They're gonna get older one year at a time. And you have to try and stay ahead of them. And uh, it's real difficult for adults to stay ahead of children. 
uh, it's exhausting and it, you gotta be smart, you know, to be able to develop your programs in a way that you can build an actual school. So our technique really was to put your head down and work. Don't let other people tell you you cannot do it right from the start. So there's certain principles, I think, about how we went about doing it. And we ended up like this because we kept to that way of thinking. And although, and, and changing laws and advocating strongly, like uh, mentioned uh, earlier today, that is what is gonna keep you going. And, and um, keeping people close, like the families close together, uh, those are the people who are dedicated and who will sacrifice for success. Um, <clears throat> but I, I still want to say a little, no, so now, good. I think when we did this, there may be 200 something people, maybe a little bit more than 200 on the campus, and now we have 526, I think, from toddlers all the way to grade 12. So well, it's, when we actually started for, for oh, Navahi, we only had 36 students. Yeah, oh yeah. Only 36 in grade six through eight. Where we named the school Navahi, there were only 36. Today there are 500. That was in 1994. So it grew slowly but surely. That's how we, we grew it, not fast. You know, sometimes people wanna say, let's do an elementary program and then do it, no. No, because you can't keep it up. So when you start small, you can really put quality into your program and get your uh, principles straight with the people in charge. That's what worked for us. Um, another thing, um, and maybe as we, we also had problems internally, like we had, at one point we had a split in our school and half, not half, but a little, about a third of the families left because they were worried that the children wouldn't learn English. This is our, from the very beginning, we had the problem of people thought they wouldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. And we have had, uh, never had a kid who couldn't speak, read, and write English, even though we teach all in Hawaiian. Even our English class is taught through Hawaiian. It starts in grade five. And now we have families that speak Hawaiian at home. Before we didn't have that, but even the kids who speak Hawaiian at home all speak English and can read and write it before they even take it. So it's amazing the power of English in the community, that they can learn it. So it's, this seems strange, but it's like, um, when I was a boy, we moved from Hawaii to Germany, and <laughs> suddenly I have to speak German, because all the little kids are speaking German, so the same thing, a kid who speaks Hawaiian at home, or even goes to Navi, even with 500 kids, the huge majority of kids in Hawaii are not speaking Hawaiian, and the TV's not in Hawaiian, and the internet's not in Hawaiian, and the radio's not in Hawaiian, so they're learning English that way. And from their cousins, so it's... Um, a fear, I think, right? The fear of being, the, when we started, we had no one that had told us that what we're telling you, no one knew this, so we were just saying, we don't care, we're just gonna support oh, Hawaii, yeah. and, and they're saying, well, they'll never go to Harvard, and they'll never go to college, they'll never be able to write, they'll never get a job. But we said, well, we think this Hawaiian thing is really important, their identity, the spirituality of the family, mm -hmm. etc." cetera. So, uh, but at the same time that we were saying that, that we were really working hard on our own to make the education really good in Hawaiian. Yeah, so, one of the uh, challenges, well, for the two of us, when we had um, our children, before we had our children, we, were, um, we had to make a commitment to speak Hawaiian to each other because we had to go to school, uh, college, because I was raised in a Hawaiian family, and I mentioned earlier today that the kind of Hawaiian that I knew was getting scoldings, you know, in, in Hawaiian. I knew those words or those phrases really well. <laughs> but. Having to have conversation was a different thing, so I had to go back to the university. And fortunately, at that time in the 70s, we had a lot of native speakers still alive. They were in their 70s and 80s at that time. So uh, there was a radio show, uh, Kleo Hawaii, that was going on. We had these uh, 
uh, speakers come and speak, and we'd go and help because we were university students at that time. And uh, they were always so positive, always so encouraging, and and uh, real appreciative. I think that somebody else was worrying about, you know, our language. So we were real fortunate to have had them uh, at our time when we were learning. But when we, uh, before we had our children, we had to say, okay, now, if we're going to be doing this, uh, we have to hurry up, you know, and just speak Hawaiian with each other, because you can learn it in school, but you're not necessarily going to be using it with other people, the use of the language. So <clears throat> we made ourselves use Hawaiian, and then we, uh, when we had our first child, Hulilao, we were able to function entirely in Hawaiian, so he was raised in Hawaiian exclusively, along with our daughter who was born two years later. So those kids, when we started our Punana Leo, it was all word of mouth. That's another thing, not a lot of big advertising, because you want people who are going to be committed to the work and the sacrifice for the school. And so when you have committed parents, that means the children there are going to receive that. That is, they're going to see their parents committed, and they're going to see that there are other parents with their classmates. You have to have peer, a peer group of children. And then they, they understand them uh, themselves as being a part of a group of people that hold language up high. So once we started creating those kinds of groups of people, then we were able to grow the program one year at a time. Create curriculum, figure out how we want to uh, structure the day and how we want to make sure that the culture comes through what we do or how we work with our students. So, and we've had help from other indigenous peoples as well, um, like uh, Sister Lazor, who came to Hawaii from, she, she's a Mohawk. Mohawk. Yeah. She was a nun at that time. We had a lot of fun <laughs> with her. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with her. And she helped us because the Mohawks were already doing immersion. We didn't know we were doing immersion. They said, you're doing immersion. We said, oh, OK. We didn't know what immersion <laughs> was, you know? We just want to bring the old people together. But she came, and she showed us some of the things that they were doing uh, over there in her uh, reserve, Kaknewaga. And we just you know, really owe her a lot of uh, thanks, too, for helping us yeah. during those early years. And we, again, and the Maoris also helped us. And the us Maoris, oh them. yes. We go they, back and forth, you know. But yeah. before we even started, we heard that they were having, they were doing this uh, language nest. And we had some friends there who told us that they were doing it. And so we said, okay, we're going to. Let's try the we'll, same thing. Yeah, yeah. we'll try it. Mm -hmm. But we w didn't have a chance to go and see it until a few years later. Like eight years later. But, <laughs> but when we started, because uh, there was another person with us, uh, Tamati Reedy, at uh, the University at Manoa in the doctorate program, and he said, you know, we're going to go home. I'm going to bring our old people together with our babies. We're just going to put them together and make them talk. And then we thought, yes, we will do that, too. It had nothing to do with certifications. or So we like that. You know, just get old people. You can't say, oh, because you're just a native speaker, you can't because you don't have certification. No. So. We agreed, yes, we do that at the same time. And with each year that they started, we would have, it took us two years to start up one. They had like 100. That's, this is New Zealand. So we have one school, they have 100. We have five schools, they have 500. That's how they grew, yeah. you know? So for us in Hawaii, we, um, we don't have the, uh, the amount of people who could speak, so we didn't have that choice. And also that um, we had to go slowly in order to be successful with what we're doing. I think um, it's an interesting thing coming here, and one of the people here asked me how many Hawaiian languages are there. There's only one Hawaiian language, and a considerable population of native Hawaiians. Um, so I think in Hawaii there's about 250 to 300 thousand Native Hawaiians. So it's a big ethnic group, but you have, uh, I think you kept the language longer here than in Hawaii. Although we have, um, it's in songs and 
place names, but actually speaking it, I think your people kept it much longer here. You have younger people um, born after 1920. <laughs> uh, so in, in our case, it went out pretty fast, uh, but lots of words remained. Um, but where was I going with this? But New Zealand, they have even more. So I think the larger ethnic groups are able to move more quickly and also people who have more native speakers. But it seems like everybody can, can move forward on this. But you have an advantage in Alaska, like you're kind of a, a big group and kind of a strong culture and you can move quickly, maybe more than some of the smaller groups in Alaska. So I'm sure people in Alaska will be looking to you to see you know, leadership in that. So um, that's why we have a responsibility as slightly larger effort to help other people and share. Um, so anyway, um, we began with only 14 kids on, in Hilo and we had to go as a stream into a school and then we had to rent a place to do middle school and find another site. And so we took those 36 kids from middle school, moved on to that site, and then we built a, a preschool and an elementary thing at the same time we were going through high school. So it took a long, it took a long time. What you see that we have and when Rosita came, we had already pretty, we've already had our first high school graduation. We were really worried if kids would even, the families could even stick it out. How many kids do we have graduate the first? Five. Five students. in 1999. So, mm -hmm. so it, was, it was hard because people start getting worried and, and then there are other reasons that they move away and things. So it's really hard to maintain that first group. Yeah, but, and, and then the kids act up, you know, where that <laughs> goes. <laughs> the kids act up, you know, they're, in, in, they're intermediate, they get into high school, they know more than everybody else. You know, and so one family had twins, and I mean, the mother was, oh, she just couldn't. And she, uh, those two boys were from the preschool, and they were just giving her a terrible time. So when they're in the, one left in the ninth grade, the second one left in the 10th grade. And then uh, today, uh, that first one who left in the uh, ninth grade is our, our first grade teacher. <laughs> So, yeah. so they both graduated from another school in Hilo, but I mean, you know, it comes around, but when they're in high school, they can really make it a challenge. Yeah. yeah. Especially when they're different. So yeah. they're different. So they want to be like everybody else. But now it's getting better, but they still have teenage oh, yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, some people think, oh, it's going to solve, you know, they're going to turn into angels. And <laughs> so maybe how the old people weren't angels either. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. but... After they graduate from high school, then they start to go like, whoa, 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 whoa how lucky I was, and, and they want to come back and, and get to, but there's that little time when you got to rule them a little bit. That's, yeah. That was really rough for us at the beginning because we had such a belief that the language was so strong and they would turn into perfect angels, and <laughs> our own son was not really that no. <laughs> angel <laughs> No, no. In fact, you know, those guys would rally uh, strikes, you know, on our uniforms. <laughs> because we had a uniform, or we still do, uh, and they would get their friends together and protest, you know. <laughs> so that was in the early years. We haven't had kids organized like that oh. after, after that year. But, but anyway, they, they're just like any other, you know, young people in high school. You know, they have things they want to do, but... Um, I know that each and any, every one of them know that their uh, education was um, unlike what most people do. And for that, I know that they um, have a lot of aloha for what their families provided for them. And um, as um, the, in the video, Kanani, who, you know, they have their own children, they bring their children to the school. And uh, so things, you know, go around pretty well. Yeah, I think at this point we're going to show another video about how they, um, what the products of the school are like once they get Finish, you know, into yeah. young adulthood. Because that's the big question that people have. Like, if, if you really end up using a language uh, that almost went extinct and is tied to an indigenous culture, how can they fit into the contemporary world? Can you have 
a base in an indigenous language and culture and still be successful in today's globalized world. It's not just in contemporary Hawaii or contemporary United States, but in the whole globalized world. Yeah. So we'll, we're gonna show a video on that. Then. <clears throat> Before you even walk in the door, you can hear how special this place is. It's not only that these keiki are growing up learning and speaking their language that makes these schools so special, but it's the way that they come to view and interact with the world around them. It is. The life lessons that these keiki learn, whether it's awamukuleana, or stepping up and taking responsibility, launa amalama kanaka, knowing how to greet and interact with all kinds of people, even the constant lavena checks are guidance on how to carry themselves. And I think being comfortable in the aume ume, or the struggle necessary to succeed, those kind of ha'avina are the ones that ground future leaders. It's also the way that these ha'avina are imparted. Through our Olala Hawaii in these spaces and by people who embrace this older way of thinking, I think it's that way that's encoded in our Olalo that really has an impact on who we become and who we are as individuals. Eva came to us almost right out of high school, so it wasn't necessarily her experience or her expertise per se that we hired her for, but her work ethic, her respect, not only for authority, but for what we're trying to accomplish as a business, and her ability to fight through the struggle of learning new things and really wanting to nail it. Those kind of characteristics in an employee are priceless. She's since completed her BA in journalism and a master's in organizational leadership. So these graduates like Eva aren't just well-versed in things Hawaiian, but they're well-educated and they're good at their craft. So they're pushing the envelope regardless of what language they're doing it in. But the beauty of it is they can do it in Hawaiian. Mahope o ke kanakolu a oi makahiki o ke kokua makaho o kele ana i ke kahi o na o kahi ho ola o lelo o iwi i kaikaloa apuni koho nua. It's been such a wonderful experience. It's a great melding of my skills, my passions, and the people I've met, the places I've seen, and the exposure I've gotten. Eia no ma kone o oiwi TV ma witwik e lua kaukani umi kumalua. Ua po mai ka iloa. A i ke lea wau ma muli ke la o ka uhana i ia ma ka papahana me ka paa o ka olalo Hawaii o ia ka uka hua. I hua ka i olu olu lea lea a pale kana ke kahi a ho i hou aku oi i kou ai na aloha. Ko ana hana oli, hana ka poe a. A unique identity that I get from Hawaiian being my first language and the language that I was schooled in and raised in, it makes me feel very comfortable with who I am and I could go anywhere. I could live anywhere in the world and feel comfortable with who I am and succeed in everything that I do. I think the biggest misconception that we have is that students that learn in a Hawaiian medium environment won't be able to live in the English-speaking world. Should we schedule something afterwards to talk about the tourism conference? It's a complete misconception. People will be able to see that's not true, especially now that we have so many graduates you know, going to college, working in so many different fields of employment and doing really well and succeeding. We've had some wonderful opportunities come our way, like Oana by Hawaiian Air. That's pretty much a feather in your cap to be able to you know, design a plane. I feel really lucky to be working even around a program like this. It's really something, it's really incredible what's going on. Kahi, Lua. There's just this level of self-value. You're starting from a position of strength, you're enhancing that position of strength, and that's the place where you can go out and become better at anything. Now that's the place where you can go excel in medical school because you know that you can handle something, you know where you're starting at. Kapoe Hawaii Apau. 
e kule ana ko mako mako paka hia pau e pia e ke kahi kulana o mako na luna. We have to put ourselves into these positions, and we also have to turn around and help people get here. With that kind of mindset and perspective on their kuleana to contribute back to a broader community, to me, it's obvious how they're all going to effectuate positive change. And it's only just begun because every single year, more and more ohana, many of them leaders themselves, are becoming a part of this papahana. My younger brother was in the first class at Kula Kayapuni. He started as a second grader. And then my youngest brother started two years later. And so, when we had our keiki, we always knew we were going to send him into some sort of immersion program. That I graduated from the William S. Richardson School of Law. I got a certificate in Native Hawaiian Law. And I just think having the perspective of what Hawaiians are going through and having an understanding of that whole spectrum, you know, where we've been, where we are now, and where we hope to go. I think that's why it's important to have that grounding. The sooner you can get it, I think the easier it's going to be for them to understand the context behind things as we go on. Okay, so it seems like we're taking a little longer than we need to. So we have another one just showing about the preschool, but I don't think we need that. We've shown you the basic idea. Um, our laboratory school is the strongest Hawaiian language school in the state, I would say, because it's total everything. Not only do we teach English beginning in grade five, but we also teach Japanese. All kids study Japanese in elementary school. We have Chinese and we had Latin for all of them in elementary school because English is easy for them. So we started teaching other languages before fifth grade to kind of show people. And they say that if you know two, that you can learn other ones uh, more quickly. But it's hard for us to do that. We lose our teachers and etc. But we, we um, do teach other languages because the idea is to connect to the whole um, world. Um, we want to get to the part where we can talk. Yeah, so we're going to have questions, but I think it's important to mention that people said that their kids would not graduate from high school. And our laboratory school, since its first graduating class in 1999, has had 100% high school graduation. And that's not the statistic in the state, especially for Native Hawaiians. And we are in a very poor area in, in Puna, which is a, there are two areas in the state that are designated by the Department of Education as special needs area. One is Waianae, and another is Puna. That's where our school is. And then we have 87% um, going on to college. We've had kids go to Stanford, Dartmouth, <coughs> UH. of course, the University of Hawaii system. Uh, we had one kid who left in ninth grade who now is teaching at Oxford. So they can speak English. You heard them speak in English. They can speak English. Yeah. So, so we're no okay open for questions, I think. Okay, I think we're open. We're just going to not show the last one. That yeah. was just about the Punana Leo. It's just about the preschool. Yeah. But that sounds like that's where you guys are. Hmm. Um, we can also talk about university programming, because we had problems with our university program. We weren't producing speakers, but eventually we got to it. And it seems like you guys are on the roll on that area, too. We can talk a lot. Yeah, we can talk a lot. <laughs> so rather than going on, maybe yeah. kind of direct our, yeah. <clears throat> our topics. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm Dr. Ginny. Hello again. Hello. Um, a question, I guess we're with the Immersion School trying to figure out our next step. And we, this is our first year running. Um, and we have had trouble with capacity, having enough people to hire to bring into our classroom, um, been a big struggle. You know, they either have the teaching skills or not the language skills or vice versa. Um, 
but we do know that we have to move forward, but we're not sure, do we, we have ages three to five, but we have a lot of our kids who've been with us. We did toddler time, um, just voluntarily. So every week we met, we spoke only in Tlingit for at least an hour, and those kids are now age eight. And so we're just wondering, do we start like a toddler room? Do we move forward to trying to open a kindergarten? And what does that look like? I mean, I know you guys don't have federally recognized tribes the way we do, so I'm not sure what route we would take, but I guess we don't even know which direction to go. If, if you guys would suggest going younger next and try to build those guys up and maybe we look at the five-year plan and say in five years we open a kindergarten or if you have any suggestions on that for us. Well, of course we have suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> we have suggestions. Well, in our experience, the younger the better. And that, that very first class in Hilo, when we had 14 kids, the, there were two girls that were uh, uh, old, that were too old, they were born too early, that couldn't continue in the program. So we had, uh, they had to leave and go into English. But the very next class became the lead class for the entire uh, program. So there's going to be that. There's going to be that. You can't hold on to everybody. So you want to make sure that your, your program uh, is going to be one that you can build upon. So as soon as you start your, your lowest level, uh, and there are students in the lowest level, you're already planning for the next level up. So when our, those children were in the Punanaleo, the original children, then uh, eight of them were ready to go into kindergarten. Uh, those parents agreed that we would hold them back at our preschool. And because in, in Hawaii at that time, you didn't have to, it was an option to go to kindergarten. So we held them back. And at the same time, we were lobbying the uh, Department of Education to bring this kind of uh, pilot. We called it a pilot. They never thought that it would become what it is today. They thought, oh, it's a pilot. So we, we asked the uh, Department of Education to get it passed by the Board of Education to pilot two sites. Uh, in the Department of Education schools. And then they said, yes, okay, you may try. So one of those sites was in, in Hilo. It was a K-1 class combination. So we moved those kindergarten uh, students into the first grade and then the next group up into kindergarten. So we had like a group of, of students there. I think that's where we also had something like 12 students, and those are the kids that moved up together. So with every year after that, we had to develop the next year, and the next year, and the next year. Um, I'm going kind of fast well, with, with the history of that thing, but um, skipping over all the laws we had to change in order to be able to move it into the public school system. Punanaleo is private nonprofit. And we could have continued, there was tuition that, that Parents were paying $110 way back then, 1985. And uh, they do service, in-kind service, cleaning, bringing snacks. And then they have to go to a language class once a week on Thursday evenings. So they have to make that full commitment. So we made $110 in order to be affordable. The teachers were paid minimally. And the uh, kupuna, our uh, native speakers, they would come when they could come. So that's how we started uh, the Punana Leo. Once they got into, we got the okay to move into the public school system, we made the decision we're not gonna stay private because we don't think we should be paying for education through our language. It should be free like English is free. So we had to lobby, that was a whole bunch of laws. So you know, our, you can imagine. <laughs> Okay, what Our that was like. Our families just didn't have the money to run a private school, and none of the private no. schools were willing to chance no. it on no. what we were doing. No, so, so once we, we got the okay to pilot, then uh, we'd say uh, to them, okay, they say, well, we don't have teachers, the whole capacity, we don't have teachers. We say, we will find a teacher. Uh, but we don't have curriculum in Hawaiian. We say, we'll make the curriculum. And they say, oh, okay. You can do all the work. Now, this is another part. Don't grumble. You do the work. 
because they don't care if it doesn't work. They don't care. They can say, well, we, we made, you know, you, we tried, but we don't have the teacher, we don't have the materials, and they'll just shut it down. You have to make the sacrifice, meet, make the materials, train people, send in a person. In fact, those first people, we called back, poor Nanny Wilhelm from Oregon. She was working at the Ben Franklin Bank. And we said, do you have your certification? She said, yes. Come home and be our first K-1 classroom teacher. And she had high school certification, uh, not elementary. Not elementary. But the state let us have her. And then the parents came and helped in the classroom. We went there and We went, volunteered. And and, but she flew home and she did it. So you have to look for the person that can open the way you know, for you. And uh, she taught there for many years. And uh, we, there was another teacher on Oahu at the YL school, same thing. So w with every step, there are going to be people that are going to have to step up and collectively produce whatever is needed for the, <coughs> for the classroom to go. And I might say that um, you know, being kind of like, um, now we're doctors, you know, we weren't <laughs> all that stuff before, but, uh, and big into Hawaiian and learning, knowing it much better now, nobody was perfect when we started. The teachers were not perfect. Um, the elders were really good speakers, and that was what they were for. It, just speaking the language was really important, but when we got into the state, we had to have a certified teacher. So we got people that are willing to be the certified teacher and speak only Hawaiian as best, and they never went into English, um, and then we helped them, and everybody worked together to bring it up, and o over time, everyone gets better and better. So you, we couldn't wait for perfection. Um, yeah, we're I still think it's not so important. Perfect. So important, um, the, the dynamics, the community dynamics can really make it more of a challenge when you kind of find or think that somebody's better than somebody or you're not good enough or, you know, then, then it becomes more difficult. So if you have a sense of, I think this will do for now and we'll support whoever is willing to, to move in there and take on the responsibility. Support them, help them, and groom others to come into the work as well. So that all has to happen at the same time. It isn't kind of linear steps. It's a lot of things going on, uh, but with a strategy that you have in mind, so. Uh, I want to also mention something. I heard that should you go down? Uh, for us, we didn't go down for a really long time to lower ages because in our state, you have to have more people. The l younger the children are, the more people you have to have. And so <laughs> we only have so many people and then plus to pay and, all the rules, so we, we stayed with three to, I mean, three and four year olds for, for our, our language nest for a very long time. And it was only when we started having babies with the teachers to, we had that. And then we had one, one site where they did what you said. People came together every so often and started with their babies before they got a language nest going. We had that. We have an infant toddler program at just two sites. Yeah. It's so expensive, real expensive, <clears throat> yeah. So our money is difficult for us. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank <laughs> I'm very thankful for everything that you guys brought. I have a question. So some of the things that I hear as a language a teacher and advocate that I think about all the time is we have a lot of people who say, I'd love to learn Tlingit, but, and then they, they never show up. And then we also have a lot of people who show up and they're working hard and we can get them to really understand the language, but it's really slow going getting them to talk. What do you recommend? <laughs> Which you are, which group? Which group? Uh, I guess for both. Okay. How do we get more people, and then the people that we get, how do we get them talking faster? 
Well, I, I know about uh, when you have people and you want to, to get them talking faster, you have to talk more. <laughs> <laughs> Don't speak English. <laughs> That'll solve that, yeah. So we, we always said, you know, the, uh, uh, the more Hawaiian you speak with the more people in the more places, then it will become a living language. More Hawaiian with more people, more places. Uh, the, the part is that people don't want to stick to it, you know, it's, uh, oh, I don't know the word, and, oh, and then they get disgusted with, you know, thinking about it it's taking too long, you know, so um, you have to be willing to pay the price to struggle, struggle and struggle together, you know, struggle together and what is it, what could it be, what is it, I think it, this, it might be that, I think it's this. And then use that, and somebody might say, that's not the word. You're going to say, well, that's the, what's the word then? Then they're just all part of the, you know, the struggle. And, and uh, if people are not used to struggling, then it's hard. You know, when people want to have things easy, especially nowadays, now, you want it now. You're not going to get it. <laughs> 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 you don't get that candy right away. But uh, I also yeah. want to answer one thing. It's good to have people say, I want to learn, and I'm not learning yet. It's just increasing the supporters, and uh, they'll be backers. So uh, the more that's what's nice about having a larger population, is that you can have a lot of supporters who are not totally in yet. Uh, and then as far as uh, getting people to speak, we, all, we ourselves had problems speaking. Even as teachers speaking to each other, the psychology of it. So we had like language police. We'd go on camping trips and have the language police and make sure that you only speak Hawaiian and enforce yourself and uh, keep on trying. And then eventually you get into the mood of never speaking English to each other. And, but it takes time and struggle. Yeah, it uh, is struggle. And so be patient with them, but don't let them off the hook. <laughs> Yeah, be encouraging. Yeah, yeah encouraging but strict. Uh, um, Lisa Whirl, and Funyesh was my Shlingit name. I'm going to cheesh for all the inspiration, for the stories. Um, I am encouraged. I go through waves. Oh, in, yeah. in like the other, both um, feeling overwhelmed like our teachers, um, but also very encouraged by what I'm seeing. And I'm lucky right now. Um, you know, I had, as a parent, got to be in the classrooms and then got to go to policy level and I get to work at the state and then the regional level. Um, so I'm working more on the policy and the support and I have so many questions, but we have just this night and I'm thinking which. But I know um, when we talk about the capacity building, you know, of needing to start somewhere, I think of our language teacher, um, when we were down in Heidelberg, and they began last year as well with the, Heide, uh, the Hakil immersion, and he said, I think, I hope he doesn't mind, but Ben Young, um, I liked his image, uh, his description of, we're building the plane as we go, right? And I think many of us feel that. And so um, trying to develop those resources you know, you're talking about like that somebody having put in that hours and that sacrifice. And um, I'm looking at those Hawaiian islands and thinking about Southeast and our geographic thing and also the limited language. And I think we have, the good news is a lot of growth around. The challenge is not as many speaker, fluent speakers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how I'm thinking, I was very interested to hear about you saying, um, you have these different connection and web of programs, and I believe we have that too. And um, we have, we also, I'm curious about, you know, um, Hawaiian, um, the working through that policy level, because like right now we have a HB 24, speaking to the limited teaching certification. So a lot of our language teachers are trying to be in the schools, but we're trying to figure out who can be in the schools. My question though for you, I'm thinking more practical. Um, how to pull in those families, and then also how to support our teacher and our speakers, like uh, on a social level, to kind of normalize that and get it, people hearing it and speaking it. 
um, but also how to pull in those families. I think that's where I'm hearing some of that. It's like the kids are learning, but having them coming in on Thursdays or what are some more of those practical things of ways you pulled in families? Because I think it's practical for learning, but I think it's also healing because I think you guys had some of that too, right? That trauma engaged, you know, stuff. So I think that there's that. So I guess I'm curious, what kind of practical supports did you offer to your speakers? How did you encourage more of that speaking? And um, how did you pull in your families? I'll take one of the little facets of that. that I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Uh, I know for uh, when we first started Punana Leo, uh, we actually wanted it to be really small because we wanted it to be strong. And so it was only word of mouth. And so I would actually go to a, like a, like a J.C. Penney's, and I'd see somebody. You know, we were there together buying uh, clothes for our son, and then we saw this parents with a boy, and I'd say, well, hey, that looks like a boy the right size, and <laughs> they looked like they would Hawaiian. be great. You know, they were Hawaiians. <laughs> so I walk up to them, and I introduce myself, and I know they were looking at me like, who is she? And then I wrote on a paper, we're gonna have a meeting for, we're gonna start this school, and it'll be all in Hawaiian. And um, uh, if you're interested, come. And so she came. And uh, well, her son is like 37 today too, and she's part of our Punana Leo program. Um, there, it, there's kind of like a, a, a thin line between uh, the world of certification and the world of we know what we're doing. So uh, we kind of dance along the edge of those two things. And um, you have to make sure that your best people are the ones that are doing what you want them to do, whether they have certification or not. So the, the government, like for us, we work directly with the state government. So uh, we have had to go and, and change laws and, and policies within our state government to allow us to uh, hire people who are not certified, but with the idea that yes, we want our teachers to become certified, but they're not certified now. So if Hawaiian language is an official language of our state, then you need to be supporting Hawaiian language and its growth within our school system. And they, well, I mean, they have to say, well, that's an interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting thought. How, how can we do that? So this is where Pila jumps in, because he's the, the uh, policy and laws kind of person. And so what would you say, Pila? Well, I'm a big advocate for changing laws, and I know you guys are doing that already, so you just mentioned something going on. But I think um, it's important to realize what you really were, to use everybody for their strengths. So first of all, I'd say when you say speakers, I'm assuming that means people are native speakers or people are really good second language speakers. So those kinds of people should be teaching, especially native speakers, should be teaching through the language rather than teaching the language. So that's what we did. That was a big change we'd made in our university program where before people would hire um, elders to teach the language from the bottom up and they could speak like nobody's business but they couldn't like teach little bits and little bits it was too rudimentary in a sense for them. So we had them teaching crafts through Hawaiian, teaching anything, and the, especially the language nest. So um, <clears throat> that's the first thing. And then the second language speakers can teach the language as a class. And uh, so we have language classes in English schools. And oftentimes the people who go to those end up being the teachers because they have the desire to really learn and they're starting to go into it. So it's not just the immersion students, but it's a bigger picture. And the second language speakers, even if they only know a little bit, they can really start moving high school students or elementary school students and the speakers should be in a place where they're using it all the time with people. So I think that was one of the big, at least for us, that was a really big change that helped us. And then the other thing was that once we started teaching, we also, um, Hawaiian was taught in the university from about the 1920s. <laughs> it's amazing that states, I mean, the territory said, we'll have it. And there was this big push, but then they really, 
Um, they had mini Hawaiians were big in churches and the ministers would be Hawaiian speakers and the only thing the kids could do is say the Lord's Prayer maybe at the end of the course. They couldn't really talk. Uh, uh, but the, the ministers just didn't know how to go from English to Hawaiian. So that was in the 1920s and it wasn't until like the 70s that we started to be able to produce second language speakers. And it had to do about learning the structure of, we both of us went into linguistics to try to figure it out. And uh, so that really helped. Uh, but the big thing was then after the second year we started teaching through Hawaiian and we teach the structure and everything through Hawaiian. That really helped us too. Uh, and then we had the elders teach things through Hawaiian. So I want to say that um, <clears throat> part of the policy is figuring out where people's strengths are. Yeah. Or like that mother that Cohen and I mentioned, she got good at figuring out how to get take care of our sites. And she was hired and she learned to speak Hawaiian. It was very hard for her. Um, but she we just started using Hawaiian in the business site more and more, and then she started picking it up and can express herself in Hawaiian. So it's all a matter of trying to figure out where's the kind best. Giving people confidence yeah, and, in and using then the language. Yeah. Not being critical, because no one's going to be perfect. You, if you're bringing something back together, you have to have pieces coming together. Not It doesn't go from zero to perfect. the beautiful yeah. heaven, you know. It, there's a lot of hard steps in there. That kind of... That's all I'm going to take advantage of my elder state here. Okay. <laughs> Not go down to the light. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, um, I'm thinking maybe we didn't learn our lesson well enough in kindergarten because we made tons of mistakes. And uh, mm -hmm. very recently we kind of did a survey uh, of all the language programs in Southeast. And um, we identified four basic types of language program, and then we made the decision that at, at TCLL, TCL, and we're going to change our name, guys. I don't like that TCLL. Let's change it to a, a native name. Right? Uh, we'll do that. And um, we, we started that at our demonstration socket, and we actually had to change the laws you know, to, uh, to get the funding to support that. Um, um, but then, you know, we used to do this assessment because we were saying, well, we're going all over, where are we, what success have we had, and what do we need to change? And so um, we decided there are some changes that we're going to need to make. But I was thinking about it. Why, what the heck are we starting a dual language program at TCLL? Why, don't, why are we wasting our time on the English? Why don't we just do the, just go for the immersion? at least to the extent that we're able to. And so I don't know, you know, we have to talk about that. Because I'm just listening to you, this sounds to me like we're wasting our time, you know, trying to do the English. Why should we do it? Yeah, we're going to learn it. And so to the best of our ability, we can move towards immersion in TCLL. That's what I'm thinking. We, we should be able to do that. And then the other, uh, what we, we're going to have a uh, meeting with you know, with all of our partners to talk about, you know, the approaches and what we should be doing. And, um, and on the plate are um, a charter school in the new room, and then also a uh, tribal college. And so those are things that are in the making right now. I just wanted to tell you guys, in case you haven't heard all of that, but we, we are progressing on that. But we, we are at the state where I think we really need to you know, have very defined efforts. Because I think we've been, you know, all over the place. You know, we just did the kind of programs. I mean, I mean, I'll tell you, if it wasn't for our PETA's program, and people like Michelle, Hans, Jessica, Mary, um, all that went through that program and then went into the school, I'm telling you, I don't know where we would be without, you know, their leadership. People like Daphne, you know, the, the teacher, they, they, they did it, you know. And so let's talk about that dual language, okay? That TCL. And then we're going to have a meeting on on um, some of the recommendations we have. But what, I'm going to ask your comment <laughs> on are we being really foolish and dumb doing this dual language at TCL? Yeah, I think it's just a couple of things before Peter goes with his. 
lecturer. Yeah, uh, you know, you know, right from the beginning, you, we looked at uh, you know our language revitalization effort as ours. You know, it's ours. So we don't do anybody else's technique or you know. So when people say you're doing immersion, we say, okay, well, that's your opinion, but we don't we don't do immersion. The word they they recognize something as belonging to them. Okay, that's that's good. But we uh, look at what people are doing well. And then we go and then we say, is there something there that uh, resonates with what we understand as being Hawaiian? And then we just pick the things that we like about it. And then we do it. And then we make it align with what we understand as being Hawaiian. This is what we did with Montessori also in the preschool when we had to you know, start up. And uh, there are certain things about that that I thought that was great. For her, uh, Mary Montessori, uh, she was a doctor, uh, Catholic, spiritually, that way. She had a sense of the spirit of the child. Now, that didn't have what kind of child, or it wasn't anything connected to a particular ethnic group or anything. There's the spirit of the child. Oh, I like the spirit of the child. I like that. I think that all children have that uh, spirit. Then also that all of her materials she created were didactic. That is, you don't even need a teacher. I'm thinking... That sounds good too. That would be something that would help us because we don't have too many teachers, right? So how can we use that way? What kind of materials can we use uh, to make it our way? And uh, then the rest of it we don't have to use. So that's how we look at almost um, a lot of things that are happening. You know, why is that so great? And when we look at it, maybe we'll think, well, I don't know, we're not going to use anything. I don't know what's so good about that. There's dual language, these kinds of things that are going on right now. And in fact, Pila, he's going to speak to that because he went. Uh, we're open to looking at things, but if you, if you know that what you're doing is what you're doing, you're not going to ever turn into that program. That is, we're not a Montessori school. We'll never be that, you know? So use what you want. If it doesn't match, then you don't um, use it. Uh, but there are some things that other people do that we can really make good use of for what we do in Hawaiian. Pilo? The same thing about what we do. Take the good and jets in the rest. Um, but I want to mention about, because the dual language has to do with English. So you saw one of the people named Wilson, that's our daughter, only spoke Hawaiian at home, <laughs> only spoke Hawaiian at school, all the way to 12th grade, and then she went off to college at Loyola Marymount in Los Angeles, and she could speak English. You could hear her speaking English, but if you heard her speaking English when she was a little girl, and I remember going to the Hilo airport, and she had a balloon, and I guess she was like four or five years old. Must have been real small, because the balloon got away, and she turned to this lady and tried to speak English, said, jump, jump, the balloons, they jump, they jump. So the word for fly and jump is the same in Hawaiian. And so she was talking like that, and now you listen to her went on the, she speaks, she, to me, she doesn't sound, she comes from Hilo. Um, so, her, you know. <laughs> yeah, so in Hilo we have pidgin English and we have standard English, but they can all speak pidgin and standard English and plus Hawaiian, so it's something about the community, and I think because they go to school in Hawaiian, they feel like they have to learn, teach themselves English. So they more want to speak English than maybe the normal kid in Hilo. So I don't think you need to worry about the dual language. It's also developed primarily to address immigrant students. They put half Spanish from Mexico and half kids, so, um, you're not immigrants, you're from here, you know. And I would say, I'm sure you'll be able to speak. I have never met a Clinket yet who couldn't speak English. There must be some maybe in the 1800s or something, but not today. Well, that's just our that's opinion. That's my opinion. I'm giving, just throwing it out there for you. It's our opinion, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. Plus, you have so many sounds in your language. You've, you've got every sound in English plus extras. So you, for us, we have a little hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. 
Um, aloha. 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 Um, a few years back, I was um, living down there in Hawaiian Islands. I was kind of on my walkabout. And um, coming back home, I returned um, to the preparation of celebration. We used a lot of our song and dance in the revitalization of our language, I felt, growing up in the community of Yakutat. And in um, the threshold of what uh, Juno offers to the communities and neighboring villages, um, definitely has a lot of supports within the Klinkahani, um, Simpshan, and Haida. But um, the TCLO program was a major influence. I felt then I didn't quite recognize the impact because it was freshly being implemented. And then in the um, year of working with Gold Belt Heritage, which I'm currently with, which is our nonprofit, we had a time for healing. And so within the three years that I've been with, we had two um, totem poles raised over on South Douglas, a major statement for us as Clinket people, maybe the state of Alaska, continental North America. Well, within that three years from being um, preparation for celebration, working with the youth of TCLL, to where I'm working with the same kids that are in third grade, that are now stepping into a middle school. They are now um, advanced far further than I was, you know, growing up in the village. And so all my uh, prepping for being an on-site type M certified um, instructor, apprentice um, in arts and language, um, I didn't know what to expect because we, they were already ahead of us and what our semester quarterly you know, prep was. And so all of a sudden, where our whole teacher planning, we had to put that you know, whole prep aside and acknowledge that they're ahead of us. And we didn't want to like let them know because of um, that shock factor of the real, but to like not be timid to what we want to expose to them, which is confidence but to assure them that you are much further ahead of me back when I was in sixth grade or in third grade, you know, without the protection of my grandparents, which you know, we're no longer with for many of us, that they have something that's being accepted into the schools more openly than what it was, say, like, I had have to go home after school, go be welcomed by my grandparents to figure out what I just was away from you know all the hours of to go home and get comforted with Wasiti, how are you? And then we give them a response. But then I'm hearing and seeing this in the schools with full confidence that they want more of a response from us as instructors. And I don't want to let back saying that, wait, well, you're gonna have to tell me um, your understanding to furthering this in conversation without making them feel like they're um, upping me as an instructor. <laughs> or you know, as a student or someone learning, but to give them that like allowance that maybe at some point they'll be teaching me more than I will be them and not to discourage our instructors or be discouraged myself or any of my peers or anybody else that's freshly stepping into the realm of what that may be as a student. But there are certainly a number of them that are um, a lot more exposed to the totems, the clan house, the art is more welcomed through jewelry, through just general attire than it has ever been. And you know, within the five years that I've been back home, that's most definitely grown. And then in the 10 years of being away and traveling in Hawaii and other places, um, in that absence and returning back and even in the little efforts I do as an artist or as an instructor, um, what can I do to support my peers, instructors, and others without discouraging the little ones because at some point they're gonna be the ones teaching us. What age? Uh, Gold Belt Heritage Foundation. Age. Oh, Villet, what's that? What age group? Oh, what age group? It um, primarily is, uh, the last group was sixth grade, and then uh, prior to that um, was seventh and eighth grade, and then the following semester. Um, which is right now, but they're prepping me to go work with um, Gastonu Elementary School, and that's the second graders. But as a type M um, certified instructor, I um, implement a lot of um, curriculum development through art. And so um, we're implementing um, 
through references and um, instructors and other um, elders that are able to um, be guests in the development of reference and um, curriculum. And so um, kind of all around right now. So. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, OK. Um, well, you know, a middle school students <laughs> are unforgiving, you know? <laughs> middle school, high school, oh, yeah. Uh, well, fourth graders, I mean, they start right there, four, five, and up. But uh, I know for us with our, our students, um, it, if this be the case, uh, they have to understand that uh, we are all connected one with the other. So their behavior or how they treat you or people uh, as uh, people who are older than they are, they have to respect that you're not in competition you know with your teacher but that's what they do you know when they get into inter intermediate and high school they they get that way but you want to remind them not so much by telling them that's one thing too about middle school or high school you don't you, you cannot tell them too much because they know more than you right so you have to kind of like bring it around the edge so you're you're an artist okay so you so you must have that style of getting the point across without going directly to the point, you know? And they're gonna get it. They're gonna get it through art because if you're an artist, they're gonna get it that way, you know? So uh, just always think of it as um, you have something to offer and even if you, they may know more than you would have, you knew at that age, that's great, you know? That's a great thing when our children know a lot more than we knew. I mean, they know a lot more than we knew, you know, at the age that they're in, and that's what we want with this kind of uh, work that we do. But the uh, personal relationship is one that requires a, a larger understanding of how we are as a people and as a family. And uh, they don't have a choice but to understand what that means, you know. so. The, uh, I guess the closer you are with, with understanding what that is, they'll get it. But if you don't feel real confident about what that means to you, then they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna feel that um, from you. So, but you have, you have the answer, you're just thinking it has to kind of like make sense in a particular way. I, you just <clears> gotta <throat> think through it again. I think it, you got it, I think. How do you step into the threshold of uh, curriculum and expectation of the district requirements are? Okay, now, see, now he's talking another language. <laughs> yeah. See, and this is another part that is, um, can really, um, you, I tell my teachers, I said, you start teaching, that, when you start thinking that you're the teacher, then you're in trouble. Because there's something about this thing called, I'm the teacher that causes some distance between you and, and, your, and your students. You have to think of yourself as not in that way. There are, cert there are laws, certifications, and policies that we follow. We have to be compliant. But the way that you teach has, I'm not gonna say nothing to do, but a lot to do with something other than that something other than that. So we can be compliant, but the real success of language revitalization and the revitalization of our culture for today and for the future has to do with other things, other things. And that's what we wanna really hold on to and, and understand a little bit better, but we won't really understand it totally, which is part of the way it's supposed to be, yeah. Uh, I would like to just add a little something there. Um, I think kind of what Kauna is saying is that you're recreating the community of the Clinket speaking people. So I don't know what Clinket culture is, but in Hawaiian culture, uh, young people are supposed to respect older people, even just a few years older brother and sister. And so that's more important than all the math and science and art or even the language and everything of being a good fitting into the ideal of so 
young teenagers and stuff, they go through a period where they're trying, but you have to try to do that. So one thing that I remember about the Punanaleo that seemed very strange for a language program <laughs> is that the kid, when the kids eat, they're not supposed to talk. <laughs> so, because that's the way the Hawaiian home is. You guys go in there, you guys eat, pow, get out and go do something. And, but they're trying, they're saying it's a language program, they're supposed to, no, they're not supposed to talk because that's how grandma and that's how we were raised and go eat and get out. So it sounded like, wow, that's what kind of language teaching is that when they're supposed to shut up? Well, part of the Hawaiian culture and language is don't talk all the time. You have to know when to be quiet. So mm -hmm. that it's not just about the language, it's about a way of being. And uh, sometimes, sometimes the kids will challenge the way of being. Um, and it's hard for us like especially like me, I mean, I'm not Hawaiian and I have to try and fit into that and I'm not a perfect challenge. A big <laughs> challenge for me, but sometimes I get whacked over, over that. But so it's not just about um, saying the words or whatever, but just a whole way of being and uh, it's tricky. Okay, <clears throat> Christy, mahalo, mahalo Nui. <clears throat> Ms. Cheesh, Ms. Cheesh, yeah. Helenoi and Kila, we sincerely appreciate you coming oh, out. Oh, 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 thank you. So policy makers, teachers, language teachers, parents, community advocates, it sounds like we have a lot of work to do to come back together to collaboratively think about how we move forward with our efforts. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, again, we have one more presentation, February 12th, and um, please drive safely on your way home. Sorry, there are flyers out on the back table about our new podcast series, those celebration deadlines, and if you didn't sign in, please remember to sign in on your way out. Gunish Chish, take care. Yeah. <laughs>